So hello everyone, and welcome to the Faculty of Arts Prep Week session, an introduction to the social sciences. This session is for students who are entering the Faculty of Arts this fall, who'd like to learn more about what you can study in arts, what to expect in the Faculty of Arts, and resources and supports available for new students. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Amber Osterman and I do communications for the faculty. I will be your host for this session. I also want everyone to be aware that this session is being recorded. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that although we are together virtually today, the U of M campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So welcome to today's session. We're so very happy that you've chosen the Faculty of Arts for your education. We have plenty to cover today. You can see the agenda here on your screen. Today, you're going to meet Dr. Greg Smith, an Associate Dean of the Faculty of Arts and an Associate Professor in History, and Dr. Julia Gamble, Dr. Umut Uzulu, and Dr. John Siriu, uh, both from Anthropology and Economics, who are going to share more about their areas of study. If you have a question during the session, please use the Q&A function to ask it. You'll see that in the menu bar on your Zoom screen. We will open up a time for questions at the end of the presentation. We often find that many questions attendees have are usually answered during the presentation. So please hold on to your questions if you can until the end, and we'll be sure to answer everything before we finish off. Please use the Q&A function and not the chat function. Thank you. Throughout the presentation, I also encourage you to take a screenshot of any of the slides you'd like. We have some with web addresses listed on them uh, or course names and numbers uh, that you might like to refer to later. And also remember, because we are recording the session, it will be available in a day or two on umanitoba.ca and on our Faculty of Arts YouTube channel if you'd like to go back and refer to anything a second time. Or if you have friends and fellow students who had to miss today because of work commitments or other commitments, please encourage them to go back and watch the session on YouTube later. I'd like to now turn it over to Dr. Greg Smith, who's going to tell us a bit more about what the term arts actually means and what you can study in the Faculty of Arts. Dr. Smith. Thanks very much, Amber, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, as Amber said, welcome to the Faculty of Arts. We're very pleased to have you with us and we uh, really believe that you've made a great choice to study with us. So I'm here to talk a little bit about what arts is and uh, who and what kinds of things we study in the faculty. So what does an arts education mean? Arts refers to the liberal arts, which is a term that originated in, in the edu educational systems of the uh, ancient Greek and uh, Mediterranean worlds. And the liberal arts refers to a handful of subjects that um, traditionally, anyway, anyway, people would prepare uh, for a life as an elite man. So this was a very uh, different world, of course. Uh, so people weren't preparing for certain jobs, but they were preparing themselves for life, for the art of living well. So in the, uh, in the medieval world, when the university started to um, be created for places of training, especially in Europe, there were seven, seven liberal arts uh, subjects. So grammar, rhetoric, logic, geometry, arithmetic, music, astronomy. And these were the subjects that any educated, any well-rounded man uh, and elite men mostly at that time, these are the things that they would learn about before turning to more specific professional training if they wanted to, uh, as doctors or uh, lawyers or theologians. And universities really were uh, mainly training places for uh, people going into religious service, originally anyway. So 
Of course, we're a long way from that now, from the ancient world or the Middle Ages, but some of these subjects are, are still taught in faculties of arts or faculties of liberal arts uh, all around the world today. So uh, I want to move to today and talk about what uh, arts at the University of Manitoba looks like. So first, I can tell you that um, you've chosen a, uh, a course of study or a faculty in which to study that many people have done before. It's a very, uh, a very popular pathway for people in university to take a liberal arts education. We have over 4,700 undergraduate students uh, registered uh, every year in arts. So we're a very big faculty and about 500 uh, additional graduate students. So people doing masters and, and PhD programs. So uh, all of these people have made choices to study uh, one of these various subjects or areas in the Faculty of Arts. But what they're studying varies quite widely. So we hope that because of this broad range of courses that we have, that you'll find your path uh, or your calling at some point in your studies. We've got 26 areas of study to choose from in the Faculty of Arts. And for those of you who are just starting out, we have over 75 introductory level courses that we'll be offering in the coming year. So these are introductory courses to uh, give you a broad introductory uh, taste of the kinds of issues, subjects, problems, and skills that you'll develop as an art student. Beyond the classroom, we also offer many opportunities for students to get involved in something that interests them. So we have five departments right now that offer uh, co-op programs. Uh, so you can integrate uh, a term of work uh, outside of the university with your ongoing studies at the university. We also have numerous travel and exchange opportunities, or well, in, in normal times we do. And when those start up again, we hope that you'll be able to uh, travel abroad, take courses at one of our partner universities around the world. And those courses that you take while you're traveling and uh, studying elsewhere, they will count towards your U of M degree. So it's a great way to integrate uh, travel study and kind of cultural exchange with your liberal arts degree. And then of course on campus, we, we do have uh, various groups and uh, societies you can join. We encourage students to get involved in their, uh, in their student groups that are of interest to them. There are cultural groups, there are study groups, there are uh, professional programs or pre-professional program groups. Um, there's research opportunities as well. As you move along in, in your degree, you may find that there are uh, professors who are conducting research who are looking for students to hire to help with them. Uh, so keep an eye out for those opportunities to expand what you're learning in, in arts and uh, finding ways to apply that to your current life, but also anticipating your future life post-university. Now, even while we are remote this year, you will still have access to professors and uh, student advisors who can help you along the way. And you can be part of uh, a number of activities that have made the shift to online, like uh, so many things have done. And this will still give you a chance to experience your university education, uh, the, the unique things that we do in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Manitoba. Uh, in your own way and hopefully with an eye to moving back to something closer to uh, the normal world in the new year. So the Faculty of Arts, we offer three Bachelor of Arts degree programs. The BA general degree is a, a 90 credit degree program which could uh, could be completed in one year, sorry, in three years. And then we have two four-year degree programs, an advanced degree and the honors degree. And what you choose or what you'd like to study within those degrees is, is up to you. And uh, it also depends on what your plans are for future education, uh, pre-professional study or graduate studies. You may, you may want to complete a, a BA degree on your way to uh, law school or to medicine, or you may want to go off and do a music degree afterwards. All, this, all of these things are possible uh, by starting in the Faculty of Arts. And once you've taken some of the courses that we offer and, and gotten a feel for your chosen area of study, you may decide to change your mind. Uh, and that happens all the time. And it's fine. And it's probably good because you're following your path of interest. And uh, 
uh, and those paths may intersect with other things that you didn't even know you were interested in uh, when you start university. So uh, keep your mind open, keep your options open. You don't have to lock in before you start. And uh, as you can see from this slide, there's a whole range of things that we study, which um, uh, often are uh, integrated in ways that you might not yet know. So what do we study? Well, these are the different uh, departments and programs that offer courses and uh, degrees in these subjects. Uh, it's a large faculty, as you can see, with lots of interesting choices. And on this slide, you'll see that they're, um, all the areas that we offer, um, well, we offer a major and minor in these areas, but the ones that are uh, highlighted with the asterisk or in blue are the ones that currently also offer a, a co-op option as part of their degree program. Now, you may already have an idea of what you'd like to focus on, uh, or maybe not. Uh, perhaps you've registered for a variety of courses from different areas to help you choose your future major. You might know that you want to study economics or sociology or English or religion. Um, many students decide what to do a major in really only after they've had a first year of kind of uh, sampling or uh, the hors d'oeuvres, if you like, of uh, the first year. And then they decide that they uh, maybe aren't as interested in the first thing that they thought they were and uh, find their passion somewhere else. In fact, up to 60% of students uh, graduate from a different program from the one that they started up in. And uh, about a quarter, 25% of students attempt three or more programs of study during their degree. So like I say, there's lots of movement. Uh, this is very common in, an, in a liberal arts program. And it's uh, it's not necessarily uh, going to delay you either because a lot of courses uh, can be used to complete your degree requirements um, regardless of the, of the subject. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, your first year is an introduction year. It's a year of discovery. Uh, and even if you have a clear focus and goal in mind, which is also great, we encourage you to listen and learn about the areas that we're profiling this week uh, just to give you maybe some exposure to some other things that we do, and perhaps you'll get ideas for your major uh, or for your minor, uh, for your or for elective courses that you might want to just take to broaden your experience and for interest. So when you're here in the Faculty of Arts, uh, we will expose you to uh, a number of ideas, uh, a number of different skills and tasks, but we will also um, give you uh, what we call transferable or employment skills. So the, the kinds of skills that you learn through an arts degree are absolutely in demand in the workplace, and they are very transferable to different kinds of workplaces. So analytical skills, problem solving, effective communication, learning how to work with a team, learning how to process information, all these things on this slide are examples of the kinds of skills that you'll learn while studying anthropology or history or religion or economics or sociology. There's, there's skill development embedded in all of those disciplines. So it doesn't necessarily matter which subject you study because you'll gain some of these skills in, uh, in what you're doing, but they're all skills that are sought by today's employers uh, and they will expose you to different ways of understanding the world different viewpoints. Um, they'll provide you with kind of cultural competency, which is a very important uh, so-called soft skill where you come to understand uh, different points of view, different opinions. Um, so all of these are, are very uh, essential to what we do. We're not a trade school. We're not here to offer particular training in how to use a certain instrument or device but we offer a skills-based education that helps to prepare you for a future career or a number of future careers. Uh, we'll prepare you to withstand change. And this is a world of change uh, as we all know, and being able to function in a changing world is a very, uh, a very useful skill uh, for life. More than that, and often more importantly, we'll help you to become a, a better and more fulfilled human being by teaching you how to be a better friend, uh, family member, partner, parent, citizen, human being. These are all essential to the liberal arts again. And uh, a good life doesn't just happen. And it certainly won't happen if we don't take 
time to think about what that means and how to improve our world. Um, but we feel that a good life is only partially linked to good employment. Um, although that's important, it's nice to have bread on the table. But a good life is also the result of deliberate, conscious, informed choices that you make about who you want to be and how you want to live your life and how you want to fit into the world. So we help you to learn more about the decision-making process that can assist you to make those really important, those fundamental life choices in the future. So let's talk about what to expect. Um, as we're still mostly in a remote learning environment for the fall term, uh, at least for the courses that we teach in the Faculty of Arts, what can you really expect when your classes uh, are going to start up next week? So as many of you have already lived through this uh, through high school, or uh, if you've maybe taken some other courses, uh, it's the this on the left, which is the reality right now versus the this on the right. Uh, we're not yet at the point where we can have large numbers of people on campus, but we're, we're hopefully moving that way. So your experience is gonna look like uh, uh, the woman there at the computer uh, in her room. There will be online classes using Zoom um, like this or uh, other online tools that we have. And this will be uh, the case until we're comfortable that we can safely have students back in lecture halls. Um, so we encourage you to set up a study station at home um, and, uh, you know, you won't be carrying all your belongings to campus for an all-day cram session uh, and you'll probably be eating lunch in your own kitchen instead of the, uh, the cafeterias on campus. But there are many similarities to uh, all these kinds of studies. So the expectations, you think broadly about the expectations of the work that you'll be doing as a university student are the same. We want quality work from students. Uh, we expect work to be submitted on time. Uh, these are part of those skills, those fundamental skills that are necessary for a functioning society. We have deadlines in the real world. We have deadlines in the university. Um, and we want you to succeed and we want you to do the best you can. So that will be, uh, that won't change. You'll be introduced to the independent nature of university studies versus what you might be might have been used to in high school. Uh, university has always been a little bit more, uh, the onus is pushed onto you as the student. So more time studying by yourself or in groups or more time working on your own, writing papers, doing research, going to the library and so on. These are all things that uh, were the same before uh, the current situation. And you'll also meet people. Uh, our, our faculty members have worked really hard to find ways to uh, continue that kind of community building in classrooms. So there might be uh, breakout sessions, there might be chat rooms, there might be assignments where you're paired up with the team. Uh, and these are great ways to, to meet your fellow students, to collaborate, uh, and to make connections with your classmates uh, where you can share, obviously, your academic interests, but also other interests as well. And uh, try and make your academic and uh, extracurricular goals uh, happen. So we hope to welcome you all to campus uh, sometime soon, hopefully in January. That's the plan that the university has put forward. But until then, uh, we're ready to support all students with your education and your overall university experience uh, as best we can. So there's some remote learning tips that uh, you can review and uh, in some of the other sessions this week in the UM Essentials, you probably heard some of these tips already for remote learning. And since many of you have come from this situation in high school, you might be uh, seasoned learners in this way already. But here are a few uh, tips about classes, about instructors, and about community. Uh, the majority of courses in the Faculty of Arts, as I say, will be taught uh, via remote learning for the fall term anyway. Uh, and if you've registered for a, a six credit course or, or a spanned course, as we call them, one that runs from September all the way to April, that would, be, uh, that would be online for the entire year. It won't be in person. All of the courses that will be uh, running will be accessible through U of M's learning management system called UM Learn, which you'll learn more about uh, from your professors. But really just a couple of things to point out on here is uh, around instructors. 
try and meet your instructors. Uh, reach out if your instructors have a session, a drop-in session, introduce yourself. Uh, or if you're a little shy about doing that, send them an email to just say hi or to ask questions. That's really, uh, especially in this remote situation, uh, a great way to try and um, make that connection and to uh, feel like you can open up and ask questions later on as you're learning. You can also join student groups. You can uh, build your own online study groups. There will be some opportunities for on-campus study as well. Uh, and you may actually be on campus for, for classes that are happening in other faculties. So try and uh, take the opportunities that you have to build community. Uh, if you uh, can join the Active Living Center and take advantage of the um, athletic facilities, that's also uh, a good way to balance your academic life uh, with your mental health needs and, um, uh, and try and live that balanced life that a, a true arts scholar would have uh, wanted way back in the ancient world. So I'm going to just quickly go to the next slide uh, just so we can move to our speakers. So the Faculty of Arts is divided and the, and the subjects we study are divided into really three broad categories the humanities, the social sciences, and then interdisciplinary studies. So uh, as I was saying before, the, uh, the liberal arts encompasses all of these. Uh, the humanities are probably closer to the traditional liberal arts uh, and includes subjects like history and English and uh, religion and philosophy. The social sciences, which we're talking about today, um, uh, these are, a, uh, I guess, a more modern uh, group of subjects, and you may have heard of this term before, so that's what we're going to explore. And then the interdisciplinary subjects is a kind of mixture of uh, humanities or social science approaches to uh, society, knowledge, the past, human condition, and so on. So what does the social science mean? Social sciences uh, are really uh, the scientific study of societies and the relationship among individuals in those societies. That's a really general definition. These sciences grew out of the humanities and sciences both. And sometimes the boundaries between all of them, between humanities, social sciences, or natural sciences, uh, can get a little bit blurry. Social scientists often ask questions about human beings and groups of human beings, that were, uh, that were different from the questions that philosophers or historians were asking. Uh, and their approach to finding answers was in some ways similar to the ways that natural sciences or natural scientists went about investigating things or phenomena in the natural world. So there, there's a tendency to, uh, to measure, to count, to uh, assess uh, groups of uh, people or subgroups within society and to try and analyze what's happening for that group. So when you think of uh, what uh, sociologists or criminologists or economists or political scientists do, they're often measuring or counting or assessing behavior of some group within usually modern society. Some social scientists still think of their methods as being very close to those of the natural sciences like biology or chemistry or math. Um, and you've probably learned about the scientific method in high school where you make an observation of something and then ask a question about it, well, how did that happen? And then form a hypothesis about how that might have happened. And then you test that hypothesis. So that kind of scientific approach to, uh, to knowledge and to understanding is often what's found in the social science subjects that we teach here. And, what, and these are the things that you learn how to do, the methods of social science research are what we teach you through the courses. So let's look at the areas of study that make up the social sciences. Uh, on the next slide, we've got uh, things like anthropology, economics, linguistics, uh, political studies, psychology, sociology, and criminology. And the two that we're gonna talk about today are um, anthropology and economics. So let me just give you a quick sampling of some of these uh, topics that get studied in these departments. So in anthropology, you can study anything from cultures around the world today uh, to the bones of ancient humans, including those that some members of the department have uh, dug up themselves on archeological projects. Uh, we even print 3D replicas of some of these bones to do further studies on them. And so there are uh, uh, 
lots of opportunities for that kind of anthropological work. You can study Indigenous governance systems and political studies, but you can also study ongoing interactions between Indigenous groups and the law in Canada uh, around and around the world in sociology and uh, criminology. You can learn about language in the linguistics department, including languages that are disappearing from the face of the earth, um, and uh, also about how language is structured and how we come to know and understand how languages work. Psychology, uh, you learn about how faulty your memory is. And you can also learn about uh, how to help other people deal with trauma or how to raise happy children. So these are some of the subjects uh, or topics that will be covered in social science research. And the possibilities for studying these are, are really endless. So I'm gonna invite uh, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Julia Gamble, who's a assistant professor in the anthropology department to share some of the information about her department and the fantastic things you can learn there. So over to you, Julia. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smith, for that introduction. I'm very pleased to be here to speak to you all today and to tell you a little bit about anthropology. Um, which, as uh, Dr. Smith has already noted, is uh, one of the social sciences uh, we have in the Faculty of Arts. So anthropology is, by, is quite literally the study of humans. That's what the word means. Um, and it, basically, we look at every part of humans, biological through to cultural, um, both in the past and through to the present. Um, so we tend to use analytical methods that examine humans as uh, social beings and um, we might engage in more heavily scientific approaches for example um, in terms of core sciences looking at may maybe ancient dna or proteomics or chemical analyses and we might also engage with more uh, cultural based um, sorts of analysis where we are looking at um, patterns of religion or um, how, um, how different people interact and social and cultural history. So we really are huge in scope. Um, we are interested in looking at common patterns in the human condition across populations um, and across cultures. So in this, we are also interested in not only understanding the common patterns, but in understanding any differences. And those differences can tell us something about um, how humans have adapted to their environment, about the particular cultural or population histories. Um, and that's really important because adaptation um, and diversity actually um, provides us with very important tools for moving forward into the future. Um, so in effect, it gives us um, a very important strength as, as a species. Um, Anthropology takes what we call a holistic approach, meaning that we uh, recognize that in order to understand humans um, in all of our complexity, we have to look at the big picture. Um, so this means that anthropologists often look at many different levels and, and we will look at many different facets of humans to understand uh, our core research questions. So for example, a biological anthropologist, and I'm going to talk about the different fields in just a minute, um, but a biological anthropologist um, might be interested in looking at stress indicators in a skeleton, um, but they won't understand those, uh, what those stress indicators mean unless they look at environmental factors for what that person experienced. And a medical anthropologist might be interested in patterns of breastfeeding across populations. So they might want to look at when breastfeeding stops and uh, to understand better why it stops at that point. And they'll need to understand um, a number of things to get at these, the answers to these questions. Uh, they'll need to understand the resources in the environment. For example, what food resources uh, will be around. And they'll also need to understand cultural perceptions surrounding breastfeeding and possibly even economics. So it's impossible to get at these, uh, the answers to these questions without taking that broad holistic perspective. So the way anthropologists approach their study means that we really uh, tackle some of the most challenging issues that are around us in the world today. Uh, we might be interested in 
um, why people engage in conflict and what patterns actually shape how conflict developed and maybe um, using cross-cultural perspectives to resolve, uh, to help resolve conflict. Um, conflict might, um, we might take a biological approach to understand uh, what patterns in human adaptation might shape a predilection to conflict, or we might take a cultural approach to better understand uh, the cultural variables that are shaping it. Um, we might study human adaptation in this very rapidly changing world, or the factors that shape global health um, on local or global or, or global scales. Um, so we might take very close in perspectives or very broad perspectives. Um, and we might also look at social inequality. This tends to be pretty pervasive um, in that it interacts with and shapes and is shaped by um, all of these things. So um, environmental uh, factors, um, it shapes global health and it um, is something that is heavily embedded in conflict. Okay, so you tend to see social inequality being something that pops up quite a bit. Um, and it therefore permeates many aspects of anthropological study. They're ready for the next slide there. Um, if you are uh, coming to us in anthropology, uh, you have a number of options for degrees. Um, we, we encompass kind of the scope that you can do across arts. Uh, you might uh, want to major in, in anthropology, and that would uh, be a three-year major with uh, 90 credit hours. Um, there, we also have both um, an advanced and uh, honors uh, anthropology degrees, which both take four years uh, at 120 credit hours. And um, for these, uh, the main difference is that uh, you need uh, slightly higher grades uh, for the honors program. Uh, so you would need a GPA of two or higher, um, and you would need a, a C in the prerequisite course for the advanced, um, and a C average across all the advanced major required courses. But for an honors, uh, you would need a GPA of three or higher, um, and uh, higher uh, grades in the honors subfield. So um, you would need to, so that is a primary difference in terms of, you know, when, what you're taking. Um, the reason you might take an advanced um, would be to, it, it opens doors to a, a range of other options beyond the major. Um, it does open the door to graduate studies, um, but also to other professional uh, uh, positions. And honors is what you would want to focus on if you're wanting to go on and do graduate studies like a master's or PhD in anthropology. Uh, next slide, please. I mentioned, I've mentioned some of these subfields already, um, just to cap them off, I've mentioned mostly uh, biological or uh, cultural anthropology or sociocultural anthropology, um, and there are a few other areas. Um, archaeology is one, is the focus on uh, human past uh, dealing with material culture, so what humans have left behind. And archaeologists will go into the field and conduct excavations and recover ancient settlements or cemeteries or um, or um, even things as uh, like mines or great or um, or bread ovens and things like that. So they will look at food. They will look at uh, at technology and a whole bunch of questions. Um, Anthropological linguistics is the study of uh, languages, and um, we actually have a separate linguistics department that is independent of anthropology. So while we do um, have a little bit of linguistics in our department, if you're interested in linguistics, you might want to look at uh, the linguistics department. And each of these subfields has a lot of overlap. So a biological anthropologist may also be an archaeologist. Um, and a sociocultural anthropologist may use archaeology to, to help understand cultural patterns. So we actually get quite a bit of overlap here and other subfields like medical anthropology that pulls together these, these areas. Okay, so quite broad. Um, if you come into anthropology, the first few fields through few, few courses you might look at would be um, the archaeology biological anthropology course, which is uh, human origins and antiquity, where we look at human variation, um, evolution, 
and, um, and adaptation. We look at primates and we also look at archaeology and the origin of civilizations and agriculture, for example. And in cultural anthropology, Anth 1220, um, it's a comparative study of human societies, which includes looking at languages, kinship patterns, and, um, and things like ritual and belief systems. Next slide, please. So in these, there are a number of really interesting courses, plagues and people where you study past ec epidemics, um, how people have responded to those epidemics, what caused them, and you might tie that together with a more cultural study, uh, the anthropology of illness, where we look at how people understand disease, how they define, define disease and how they feel it. Um, there are also very hands-on courses like human osteology, where you actually will work with uh, human bones and learn what we can learn from them, and forensic anthropology, which um, you might identify with uh, TV programs like Bones, and we go into it on a whole new level. Um, next slide, please. I think. Thank you. Um, so we have a number of very hands-on things with anthropology. Um, you could engage with a field school where you actually go on an archaeological excavation. We also have a very active field group. Um, I should say that the field schools are both uh, local and international, so we have a range of opportunities. And the Anthropology Students Association will help give you awareness of these opportunities and of um, some of the other things going on in our department. Um, we have a regular speaker series from uh, both people in the department and internationally. Um, and there are also opportunities through the Undergraduate Research Awards program uh, where you could potentially work with a professor doing some, of, uh, some research with them. Next slide, please. So anthropology provides you with a range of skills that are useful um, in anthropology, but also beyond. Uh, and we uh, basically, you could, uh, these are applicable to uh, a range of career sets, which I'll, I'll mention in just a second. Um, they broadly give you a knowledge of a whole um, scope of biological, ecological, and cultural factors so that we can better understand human behavior. Um, they also give you uh, a cross-cultural understanding, which you can take to understand media and things that are going on in the world around you. And they give you skills in social analysis and data analysis, which can be very broadly applicable across areas of study and across job spectrums. Um, so really, um, we can apply this to jobs both in academia and also things like working in a museum, um, or even as a social science analyst, which might have applicability in, say, a bank or an insurance company, because it's very important to use the skills um, like quantitative and qualitative analysis to understand uh, the scope of people you might be working with. Um, so there are a number of jobs that this is applicable to. Um, I'm not going to go through them all. I think I'm probably out of time, but if you have any questions later, I will be very happy to answer them. Okay, thank you all. Great, thanks, Julia. So I'm now going to invite uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Umut Ogzuglu and Dr. John Siriu from the Department of Economics to uh, offer some insights on the different approaches to economics that they provide. Uh, in economics, uh, we have In economics, we have uh, two streams, uh, one referred to as economics and society and economics and econometrics. Economics is a branch of the social sciences as already described, and it seeks to analyze and describe the production, distribution and consumption of goods and services and the expansion of that capacity. So basically we want to understand how we produce goods, the goods and services uh, that we have, how we, how we uh, consume them, and more specifically, how, we, how that consumption is distributed across society. And uh, in addition to that, how we grow uh, uh, 
that uh, production, how we uh, are able to uh, produce more from one year to the next and from one uh, decade to the next. And if we do not, what are the causes? Um, as in the other social sciences, uh, um, students have the option of uh, doing an honors uh, degree in um, economics, an advanced uh, major, and the honors could be single or double, uh, a general major uh, or a minor. The general major is a three-year degree, and uh, that is the degree um, taken by a majority of students. But students who want to go further, particularly students who want to go to graduate school, uh, generally encourage, uh, and sometimes it's required by the graduate school that they uh, do the honors program. The honors program uh, requires, uh, as it uh, uh, does in anthropology and the other uh, social sciences, generally requires students to have uh, to, uh, to carry higher grades through their courses. Um, the uh, advanced uh, single major uh, uh, less so, but it, it too is a four-year program. It, uh, students from the advanced uh, major um, can go on to graduate school, but uh, not all graduate programs will be open to, to them, but they have a few more options than students who uh, uh, complete simply the general major. Uh, uh, students can also take a minor in um, economics. Um, one, they are one of two different streams and students can do, uh, uh, can, uh, uh, do the honors advanced uh, um, uh, degrees in either of the streams, uh, and not both, uh, but the general uh, ma uh, major does not have a stream. Students simply uh, will take a, a course in, um, in um, at, one, at least one course in uh, each stream. And um, the joint uh, major, the joint honors uh, programs in, uh, uh, include economics and mathematics, and economics and statistics. Um, they, uh, there's also an MA and PhD program in economics, but I think we're concentrating more on the undergraduate programs at this point. So the introductory courses, they uh, come in uh, combination. So if a student is interested in uh, taking economics, they will take uh, one of two combinations of courses in their first year. So uh, one combination is Economics 1210 and 1220, an introduction to Canadian economic issues and policies, an introduction to global and environmental uh, economic issues and policies. These courses are taught by the economics and society stream. However, they can be used as uh, prerequisites for uh, all of the second year courses in economics. So it does not constrain the students uh, in any stream by taking uh, that uh, uh, combination of courses. The other combination is economics 1010 and economics 1020, and that's introduction to microeconomic principles and introduction to macroeconomic principles. These courses are taught uh, um, by the uh, ec economics and econometric stream, but uh, like the other combination, they do not uh, uh, restrict the student in terms of which stream they would like to uh, continue uh, beyond uh, that. The, the, these courses are uh, will be taken as prerequisites for most of the um, second year economics courses. So um, I will uh, talk about the economics and society stream and uh, a professor Uguzuglu will um, talk about the uh, economics and econometric stream. So uh, why uh, an economics and society stream? In economics and society, in the economics and society stream, we strive for a pluralistic approach to the study of economics. We recognize that there is a dominant, uh, generally referred to as neoclassical approach to the important economic questions. Some of the questions that I've mentioned about how um, uh, we uh, produce goods and services and how we uh, expand that production. 
And uh, we strive to familiarize students with that approach. But uh, uh, the economics and society stream also strives to acquaint students with alternative approaches that lead, lead often to different answers to the same question. So uh, what we try to do is to introduce students to a more than one way of looking at those questions. And those different ways of looking at the question uh, often lead to different answers, although sometimes the answers are quite similar, sometimes they are quite different. We also uh, emphasize a historical approach uh, that recognizes how the main ideas in economics uh, and uh, approaches have evolved uh, over time. So um, some of the cool courses in economics and in the economics and society stream include community economic development, where students learn about the challenging face, challenges facing smaller communities and how they can go about trying to uh, a, a increase production, uh, uh, um, increase uh, consumption, and uh, 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 improve distribution. Uh, uh, in a relatively small community that exists within a larger community. So for example, an economy, uh, uh, a community in the north of Manitoba would uh, face challenges that would be addressed in uh, community economic development. We uh, offer economics of gender, which looks at the, uh, 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 the specific um, challenges that uh, 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 particularly women uh, face uh, uh, when it comes to the uh, broader economics questions. And these are not uh, uh, both the uh, challenges they face and the effects uh, of, uh, to, uh, on them of the wider economic decisions uh, are, uh, are different. And that is looked at in economics of gender. The Manitoba economy, as its name implies, looks at the Manitoba economy uh, uh, and the specific issues relating to Manitoba as a single economy versus Canada or the world or, or smaller community. And uh, in the introduction to the world economy, students are, are introduced to the uh, uh, world uh, economy as it has evolved, essentially starting from uh, the, the times that uh, the, uh, about uh, 1500, uh, when uh, Europeans uh, um, uh, attempted to explore the uh, wider globe, uh, to the present, we look at how uh, economies across the world have evolved uh, to the present. Um, in uh, Economics 2670, which is income distribution, we looked at uh, uh, how uh, uh, income is distributed uh, across different groups and uh, the reasons for these and some of the ways to uh, uh, reduce extreme uh, inequality of distribution. Uh, um, economics uh, 3692, Economic Determinants of Health, is a really cool course that uh, looks at uh, some of the factors that are not medical, that have very profound uh, uh, influences on the health of population. So you, uh, you look at how uh, the uh, um, economic conditions under which people live and sometimes the political conditions as well as things like distribution of, of income and location affect um, how long people live, the nature of the illnesses, the uh, extent of the illnesses, etc. So um, uh, why an economics and economist extreme will be taken up by uh, a professor uh, Uguzuku. Hello everyone, I'm Umuto Zolu. Um, I'm the associate head of the economics and econometric stream and I have the hardest to pronounce last name in Faculty of Art. Um, so we, in the economics and econometric stream, we have a, um, we offer a, a degree comparable to other North American uh, universities. Um, it's comparable or standard in a, in a way that 
uh, neoclassical or orthodox economies has a very um, they, they have a very specific way of uh, looking at the world. Uh, you hear us talking about individuals respond to incentives. Um, they make choices uh, considering something called uh, opportunity cost. So, um, and we will, like in our program, we uh, present that view, the theoretical uh, approaches that, uh, that present that view. Um, but also we recognize that we live in a very data rich uh, world, uh, uh, which becoming more and more rich in terms of data. And when I say it about data, I'm not just talking about standard economics uh, information like inflation, interest rate, or employment, or uh, firm profits, uh, but um, all this extra information that we as ind individuals collect collectively generate every day by going to doctors, by making educational choices like you guys are making right now, um, or by expressing our views on Twitter. These create new information that can be analyzed and hopefully solve some of the uh, social uh, and economic problems that we are facing right, right now. These vast amount of information uh, requires different anal analytical techniques, different statistical approaches, uh, and sometimes different software to, to analyze. And we try to give these um, different flavors of analytical uh, techniques and software knowledge in our, in our department. Um, we try to standardize. There are so many different uh, approaches and, and techniques, but we try to standardize our courses that, that use a specific few software. But our faculty is knowledgeable uh, with many other um, software and analytic approaches that can be um, useful to you. Um, going back to, to this kind of wide um, view, I can go to, I can talk about more specific things that you can do in our department. Every year, our central bank, Bank of Canada, have a governance challenge where um, students from universities will kind of uh, pretend to be an economist in Bank of Canada and try to forecast next year economy, inflation rates and employment and so on. And they compete against each other. Uh, by taking one of our courses, you can be selected uh, and represent University of Manitoba in, in Bank of Canada challenge. Um, so I, I teach uh, first year courses, intro micro and intro macro, and also uh, PhD level courses. And when I present uh, economics in this introductory courses, I always say, whatever social outcomes you think of, there is an economics for that. So even though from the very beginning of our uh, of this economics part of the uh, presentation, we gave you a very narrow view of the economy as if economy is just about production and buying and selling things and money. Actually, economics, economists look at different uh, social outcomes. Um, and we try to give a, these kind of flavors in our, uh, in our course selections, whether these are environmental related um, outcome, uh, whether energy related policy or more specific technical skills given by applied econometrics courses, uh, more business-like uh, economic decision in managerial economics, uh, labor issues, employments, and how um, uh, um, people choose uh, different um, different employment outcomes, and a very specific computer-based methods that can be useful uh, if you're hired by by a firm that uh, looks at its own data. Um, we believe that this having this two stream, which is very unusual uh, in, in, in North American universities for economics department, give you very broader and richer view of uh, economic knowledge. I think uh, uh, th this is very unique uh, skills that you can you can get from our, our department. Um, we have pl pl field placement courses through the Economic Society. And if you have any details, uh, Professor Serio can uh, give you more details on that. And um, we have undergraduate research opportunities um, either through um, um, by uh, going through the 
uh, arts way, or we can go to the individual professors and they, they will have usually a research um, agendas and um, their own program that they can hire you. And we have uh, th Fridays and Fridays through the fall and winter semester, we have a very active seminar series. Um, that seminar series also continues in the summer in a, in a smaller scale. And uh, that is open to all of the University of Manitoba community. Um, so core skills learn slides is not uh, super specific to economics. I think many of the departments in arts faculty can give you these skills um, um, in, that, is, that is listed here. So looking at a social problem and break down into uh, more manageable pieces and through using uh, quantitative skills, analyze and present uh, uh, this, this data uh, and uh, find solutions using these quantitative skills. And, uh, but retaining uh, a economist pers perspective to look at these uh, social issues. Um, as I mentioned that, so because there is economics for everything, um, the, 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 the jobs that you can get with an economics degree is also um, very, very different. Uh, but wherever there is, um, um, there, there's analytical skills, reports, reporting skills are required, whether that can be within a firm or in a government sector, uh, or international institutions, uh, economics uh, students will, will, will have the um, required skills to excel there. Thank you very much. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks especially uh, Professor Siriu, Professor Ozulu, and uh, uh, Professor Gamble for sharing with us the uh, insights into some of what you're doing in your departments and uh, uh, and hopefully those of you listening have, uh, have learned a bit more about what you might study and what you might encounter. Now yesterday we covered three other areas of study, uh, history, women's and gender studies, and philosophy, and the recording for that session uh, will be up on our website shortly, and uh, this session is also being recorded, so if you want to come back to this one or uh, if someone else uh, needs to see it at a different time, that will be possible too. So uh, please check out our YouTube channel. We also have 10 additional areas that we profile on our YouTube channel. And these are videos that cover some of the same types of information that you've already heard today. So I encourage you to visit the channel and watch a few of the videos and help to learn a little bit more about uh, each of these areas of study. So we hope that you've uh, gained a better understanding of the types of things that you'll be studying now that you've joined the University of Manitoba and, and the Faculty of Arts, particularly the social sciences, and where those studies can potentially lead you after graduation. You've made the right choice, uh, as I said before, and uh, we hope that you'll find your pathway in the Faculty of Arts as you pursue your degree. So this is... Uh, uh, a quick slide that shows some of the things that people have done uh, with an arts degree. And this is really just a tiny sample. There are so many ways that people can uh, can go after their arts degree. And at the end of their uh, of your degree, it seems like a long time from now, but you uh, will be equipped to pursue a wide variety of exciting and challenging careers in today's uh, uh, changing world and arts degree holders, as I said at the outset, are in demand in that world. Uh, your arts degree is a valuable degree and it will equip you for uh, a whole range of things. Our graduates have gone on to jobs in uh, all kinds of areas of the public sector, the private sector, media, government, marketing, social services, technology, education. Uh, so here's a, a handful of occupations that may uh, be what you're looking for, uh, or it may uh, reveal to you what you can do with your arts degree and, uh, and also perhaps with some related work experience. Or you might find that you'd like to continue your studies. So many students, uh, as we say, start in arts and use what they've learned here as a base for more specialized uh, degrees like law or education. 
uh, or you might be uh, someone who goes on to a master's degree in one of our disciplines in sociology or psychology or history or economics or English. And then after a master's, you might pursue a PhD. Uh, and uh, these graduate degrees are also very highly valued. So your time here is what you make of it. Uh, there are many choices and opportunities along the way, and we hope that you enjoy sampling what we have to offer and uh, making those choices and, and learning something about what we can teach you, but also learning something about yourself. So I'm gonna pass it back to Amber, who's going to take you through the final section and uh, offer some resources. And uh, if you have questions, please add them to the Q&A. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks very much, Dr. Smith. So as you mentioned, um, we're gonna go through a few last slides, uh, highlighting some resources for you of where to find answers to some of your questions, and then we're gonna open it up for Q&A. So even though you've gone through registration uh, and classes begin next week, you likely may still feel like you're still in the planning stages of your degree. So which degree will you pursue? We gave you some of the options today. What will your major be? We showed you all of the choices. Should you choose a minor to go along with that major? Um, after hearing some of the speakers today, you hopefully have some new courses piquing your interest to fill some of your electives. So as we've mentioned, it's okay to not have it all figured out yet. A degree is an ongoing evolving process and you have the tools and supports to help you navigate through that process. We've got some resources to help. Did you know that in addition to all of the areas of study that we covered today, we also offer courses in over 15 different languages. It's often an overlooked area by students and we wanted to introduce you to our language offerings. We have options from beginner levels to advanced in all of the areas you see here on the screen. You can then take your new language on a study abroad opportunity, like we talked about earlier, where you could use it and improve it. We have a language lab in the Faculty of Arts with resources that can help you practice and apply any new language skills. In the time of remote learning, we've developed ways to offer the lab tools to students while studying from home. The lab also offers tutors to students who are taking language classes. And when we're able to come back to campus again, there's many on-campus activities like the student clubs, movie nights, and festivals that can give you an opportunity to practice your new language skills. You may decide to take a language just for interest or for a future career. There's two main ways to stay on top of your degree planning. Be sure to go back regularly and review the academic calendar. I can't stress this enough. The academic calendar is your main guide uh, and your main um, uh, go-to for your degree and for as a course catalog. It helps you to see and plan out each year of your study. It shows you prerequisites. It shows you how many courses to take per year um, as a guide. Um, it shows you which courses uh, and what leads to the next step. You're also going to learn through your time here about a tool called UM Achieve. This is an online degree audit that keeps track of what you've taken so far and what you have left to take to complete your degree. Both tools help with your planning um, as they'll show you if you're taking the right courses for future courses that you wanna take. Um, they'll help you track to see if you are going to complete your degree and graduate in the time that you're planning for. Will it take you longer? Will it take you less time? You can also connect with a Faculty of Arts academic advisor at any time to help interpret what you see in these tools. Links to these two tools and to connect with an arts academic advisor uh, can be found on our website and are being placed in the chat right now. If you have any questions now or any time during the year, we're here to help. The arts academic advisors are a trained team to help you navigate your options. They can help you plan your studies to prepare for future terms. They can discuss factors to consider when you're declaring your major. They can help keep you on track for meeting the degree requirements and to graduate. They can provide information on general services at the university as well. And they can give overall advice to enhance your university academic experience. I encourage you to contact the advisors if you're struggling or having difficulties, or you just don't know where to go to for help they can guide you in the right direction. I'd also like to point out that we do have an advisor available that specializes, specializes in Indigenous students and one in international student questions. And our international advisor is also the individual who assists with questions about exchange and travel opportunities. 
During the fall term, advisors are available by email, phone, or online chat to assist with your program and degree planning questions. We encourage you to email them directly with any and all of your questions. Advising is voluntary and it's up to you. So we encourage you to take a proactive role in connecting with an advisor. We don't reach out to all students saying, hey, it's time for your advising appointment. That's up to you to decide and to reach out. It's up to you to stay on top of your degree throughout your degree. Now we're here to help. So don't forget and don't be afraid to contact us. I encourage you to take a photo of this slide or go to the website using the link that we just posted to find this information. To continue to get yourself acclimated to the Faculty of Arts, I'd also like to encourage you to visit our web pages where you can find information on the things we've covered today and so much more. We'd also love for you to connect with us on one or more of our social media channels that we have listed on the slide. Follow along during the year to learn more about us, the courses we offer, the amazing research being conducted by professors and students, and to stay on top of the University of Manitoba deadlines. We always use social media to remind you of key dates, to let you know about contests or other opportunities for students, and to share the stories of your fellow students and alumni to help give you ideas on majors, career choices, and more. The Faculty of Arts offered a few other sessions this week to help welcome you. All the sessions are being recorded and will be available online so you can watch anytime. The link is on the screen, but I also encourage you to take a screenshot of this for your reference. There are a number of special interactive lectures from various faculties throughout prep week to help give you an idea of what online lectures will be like. Dr. Sean Carlton from Native Studies and History is hosting one of these lectures tomorrow, Thursday. In the session, he's also gonna provide some tips on how to take notes during an online lecture and how to get the most out of your online studies. So it's a great way to get a feeling for what lectures are going to look like during the fall term. There's also a number of sessions offered this week on academic writing, introductions to student communities like the Art Student Body Council that they had on Monday, and financial aid and awards. I encourage you to try to attend or go back and watch as many as you can to help get you ready for fall term. So that brings us to the end of the formal presentation and we're now gonna open it up for questions. Please use the Q&A function, again, found in the Zoom panel and the Zoom menu panel to type in your question. And as the questions start to come in, I just want to remind everyone that the presenters are gonna be focused on answering questions around today's topic. If your questions pertain to things outside of that, we recommend you go to umanitoba.ca, the website. And you can also use the Ask You Manitoba button that you can find on that website, where you can receive an online response to your question at any time. So after today, if you have more questions, feel free to use that function. Now remember, there's dedicated offices for things like admissions, the International Center, Student Life, and the First Year Center that can answer questions directly related to those areas. So again, I'd encourage you to type any questions that you have into the feature right now. Um, we're also going to go back um, to look at some of the questions that were typed in uh, during the presentation, and we can answer some of those um, and share the answers with everybody uh, right now. So I'm going to go back to a couple of those. Um, so one of the questions that came in said, do you offer classes that are directly related to the majors for first year students? So hopefully you saw the examples that we had for both anthropology and economics. You can see each area offers introductory courses. Um, you can take a sampling of courses from any of those areas, or if you already know what you're interested in, um, by looking at the academic calendar and then looking for that particular area of study, for example, economics, it would explain to you and list for you um, the recommended introductory courses to take uh, for that area of study that you're interested in. So that's the best way to look at that one. Um, we had a question uh, that came in about um, what if we want to take a double major in the future, but only but one of the programs that you're interested, um, it says that it only offers the single major option. Um, so Greg, maybe you can tackle that and uh, share the answer that we had for everybody. Right, so uh, like many things, it depends uh, which the uh, double major is with. Um, and right now, you can only complete a double advanced major or double honors in the programs that offer a double option. And that's because some of our smaller programs don't actually offer 
uh, upper level seminars for uh, so that they can offer a comparable program. Most can, but um, they have to be approved through a university process. And so the ones that are available are listed clearly in the calendar. Excellent. So Greg, I'm going to keep you online here as well. Um, we had another question that came in about what's the optimal number of credit hours to take in a year? Um, is 24 enough? Um, is a full course load required every year? Maybe you can give us your thoughts on that. Sure. So you can study part-time or full-time as a art student. Um, we realize that people uh, have much more complex lives now than in the past and full-time study maybe isn't possible for you. That's okay. Uh, the thing is that you need to complete all the required courses for your program of study. And if you can manage full-time study and take the full load, that's great. But if you, if you have to take a, a smaller load or if you want to go part-time and spread out your degree, that's fine too. It just means it'll take longer for you to complete all those courses that are required. So uh, if you do it full-time, let's say for a, a general degree, a, a, a three-year degree, but you do it part-time, it may actually take you four, four and a half, or even five years to finish all of your course credits. And that's fine. Uh, we don't mind. Uh, and if it makes it easier for your work-life balance or school-life balance, great. Um, your, your, your courses don't expire. And uh, once you've completed all your degree requirements, you will graduate. Excellent. The next question that came in is, um, what if I'm in the Faculty of Science and I later want to switch to the Faculty of Arts? Is the transition easy to switch from one faculty to another? Do you need a certain amount of credits to get into arts? Or what happens? How does that work? So Greg, maybe you can help us with that a little bit. I know that the first thing that I would mention is that if you are planning to transition from one faculty to the other, the, the a logical first step is to connect with an academic advisor um, to, to talk about that. They would go through the courses that you have taken so far, what would be able to be transitioned over, where you would need to start, and would give you an anticipated kind of length of time that it would take to complete your degree. So Greg, anything to add to that from an insider's perspective? Yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, it happens all the time. So don't think you're the first person uh, to do that. Um, and you may find that you've completed enough of your coursework, let's say in science, uh, in chemistry, let's say, uh, that you can now use that as your minor to go with your new degree in economics. So it's always a, a great idea to talk to an advisor and they can do something called a, de a degree audit, which checks out what you've done and uh, can provide you lots of upfront information about what you need to do to, to switch over to a different faculty and to complete your new program of study. But it is possible and uh, we'll help you do it. Excellent. Thanks, Greg. Um, we did get a question here as well uh, that asked uh, um, from an economics perspective, um, would an economics be a great base to go on to a future career in law? And John did answer that um, in the, uh, the Q&A, um, but I'll just share that with everybody uh, as he did mention that um, yes, economics has been for many students a great base to go on to a law degree as many as as well as many other types of degrees. Um, but it's there are many arts programs um, that are a good basis for law, education, health sciences, medicine, many others. Um, and again, we encourage you to look take a look at the academic calendar because if you have a particular target area like law that you'd like to look to um, as a second degree, uh, then it's it's great to take a look to see what they ask you to complete before you try and apply for their program area. Um, so Greg, anything else to add uh, to that or do have I tackled that one nicely? Nope, sounds great. <laughs> okay, great. Um, there's a question that's come in about co-op opportunities, um, asking in particular about job opportunities uh, a co-op program would offer for a political studies major. Um, so in general, um, co-op can provide really a, a, an unending um, opportunities um, for, for our students in terms of the types of organizations that they could be placed with. For political studies, um, one thing that I would mention is that's one of the areas of study that we profiled last year during prep week. 
So if you go to our YouTube channel, um, if that's an area that you're interested in, you would be able to watch the video on political studies. We've broken each area down so you would be able to watch just that 10 minute portion on political studies where they do talk about sample careers um, that are available for political studies. And that would be similar to the types of areas that could potentially be available uh, for a co-op uh, work term placement. Okay, so that's a great way to take a look at that, as well as uh, connecting, if you are interested in co-op, connecting with the co-op coordinator for the Faculty of Arts. Co-op is not something that you need to do in your first year. It's something that most students apply for after their second year, because um, we're asking you to have a base of courses before you join into the program. So it would, um, because there are three work term placements uh, that are part of uh, co-op, it does extend your time for your degree out because you, you switch between a work term, a paid work term, and a term of academic study. So it does extend your degree a bit, but of course the benefit to that is uh, two things. One, paid work terms in between, and two, you have work experience when you're completing your degree. So there you go uh, for co-op. Um, we had another one uh, question that came in asking about the difference between taking a psychology, uh, choosing psychology as a major through the bachelor, uh, sorry, through the faculty of science versus the faculty of arts. And if there were any major differences, um, depending on where I wanted to take psychology, because you can choose it from either faculty. Um, Greg, maybe you could help us with that one. Uh, it, the program is the same and the courses are taught by the psychology professors who live in the Faculty of Arts. The, the, the interesting thing is that psychology uh, does have a, a kind of scientific um, uh, side to it. And so um, in the past, it was um, possible to do and still is possible to do a psychology degree either as a Faculty of Arts student or a Faculty of Science student. Now, if you're planning to go on in the sciences, you might value a Faculty of Science degree, no matter what the discipline is, more than the subject. And so it might be important for you to have a science degree, but what you're learning, same thing, it's the same courses. And you'll be sitting in the classes when we're sitting together uh, beside students who are registered in the Faculty of Science uh, and you're in the Faculty of Arts. It's the same prof, it's the same lecture, it's the same course. Excellent, thank you. So that's um, tackling all the questions we have. So I'm just gonna give a couple more reminders and I wanna thank everyone for joining our session today. We hope that throughout this session, we've given you the tools to get ready for the start of term um, and answered some of your questions about what to expect when you join the Faculty of Arts. I wanna thank our presenters as well for sharing their insights with us. Um, as you can see on the screen, Welcome Day is coming up next Tuesday, so we hope you're going to join us on Tuesday, September 7th for the Faculty of Arts session during Welcome Day. That takes place at 12.30 p.m. Central Time, and I encourage you to check your student email for the registration link to that uh, event. I also want you to continue to watch your U Manitoba student email and our social media for regular information and reminders from your faculty. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. I'd like everyone to have a wonderful day. Good luck with your first week of classes next week and with the fall term. And thank you again for choosing the Faculty of Arts for your education. We will really appreciate that you've chosen us uh, as you go along on this journey. Have a wonderful day. And thank you to all of our presenters. Bye everybody.